church, friends, and family. Hey, thanks so much for being with us once again. Here we are with a series leading up to Easter on the path to the cross. We honor Jesus serving, suffering, and being sovereign. Those are the next three weeks that we're going to be covering some significant moments that led Jesus to the cross. Out of all the things that Jesus is, servant is pretty high up there. After all, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, learn to be a servant of God. Jesus did say, did say that good and faithful servant when we get to heaven. So serving is a really, really big deal. Serving's a big deal at our house too. As a matter of fact, many times in our home, as if somebody would do something that was nice for somebody else and going the extra mile, sometimes if that person doesn't know Notice, you almost have to like tell them that you have to hint around to it and we would always have this saying do you want your reward now or in heaven and every now and then it would be like no I want my reward now I want you to tell me how great I am right here in the moment rather than wait for heaven see serving is really serving when it's really done for the other person not for yourself I love to serve when people tell me how great I am I enjoy doing things to make me feel good but the real heart of serving, like Jesus did, is really that servanthood that leads us to doing what's best for others. That's what today's message is all about. John chapter 13. We're going to be covering probably about 16, 17, maybe even 18 verses today. We're going to be looking at these, this text about Jesus and, and the Passover and something significant that happened. And that's what it's really all about, Jesus the servant. I don't know if you know this or not, but the closer you get to the cross, the fewer followers you find. So here we find a significant moment in John chapter 13. Now, this is halfway through the gospel of John. Something significant changes. Up to this point, most of Jesus's ministry was to those um, outside of his immediate followers. But 13 begins the farewell discourses, as it's called, because Jesus uh, is saying goodbye to certain people. But it's also significant because he's moving very significantly to communicating with his closest followers. John 13, chapter 1. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to the Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth and how he loved them to the very end. Oh my goodness, this verse is packed. First of all, we see Passover. Passover was a very significant event that we see began back in Exodus here. And Passover tells a story and it was to remind God's people, the Jews, of his redemption, of him removing them from Egypt and, and freeing them. So so what we're going to be doing on Good Friday, we're going to be actually having a Good Friday remembrance. That's what we call it because we're going to remember. But we're going to be covering what is the Passover in Christ in the Passover. How do we see him represented in the Passover story? So isn't it interesting here? The time of Passover has come, okay? And what does Jesus do? The hour had come. Oh my goodness, this is a significant hour. In less than... 24 hours, right about 24 hours, Jesus is going to be hanging on a cross. This is like Jesus knew what was waiting him. So he shifts from being with everybody to, to his closest followers. He did what any of you and I would do. We would go to the people that we love the most, we're connected to the most here. It's a significant shift here. That's what Jesus did, what you and I would do. Those whom he loved here. And so they go to a place called the upper room. And, and when I first met Jesus, we used to have this saying, and it was that um, anytime we had a, a prayer meeting or a Bible study or a small group or a worship time that was really, really good, we always used this term, and it was that we were 
upper roomed by God. Upper room by God. And what that meant was is that the presence of God was there. Jesus was there. Something significant happened. Many times in scripture we see upper room mentioned. And, and typically something significant is happening in the upper room. So they were being upper room by God here. And so the scene is what we know as the Last Supper here. Now we're going to see later on, and, and, and what, before you turn off today, we're going to be doing communion together. And so, so what we see here is this is the Last Supper here. Now we all have a picture of the Last Supper. It's the Leonardo da Vinci picture. It's everybody on one side of the table looking very angelic and, and, and Jesus in the middle, you know. And um, it's almost like a selfie pic. It's like somebody handed their phone to somebody and said, here, take this picture. And they all got on one side of the table. That's not how it happened at all. At, at the Passover, what typically would happen is they, they, they had a very low table here. They would lie, like would lay down. They'd be lounging, typically with your left arm down, and you would use your right arm to eat here. Um, and that's what this was. It was a, called a triclinium. It was a lower table, pillows, feet hanging off the recliner towards the back here. Now, this was, this was reserved for big days. To us, maybe Easter. Uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, a big meal would be done in this way. And, uh, and so they were, they, were, they were lounging. I mean, what, what man doesn't want to lay down, uh, eat a sandwich, and, and just give me the remote? Oh, there was no remote and there was no TV at the Last Supper here. So on the Last Supper, but that's the picture that we have here. And the sign that, it was, that they were sitting later on in the Gospel of John 13, we see that, the, that John, the disciple Jesus loved, in verse 23, he leaned against Jesus. Judas was so close to him that he dipped, he, he, he dipped the bread and gave it to him. He was close too. So many people believe that John was on one side and Judas was on the other. We'll get to Judas in just a, a little bit here. So their feet would have been either down, you know, pretty much uh, sideways or to, to the back. Feet are very significant here. Now, Jesus knew the hour had come that he was going to return to the Father. That's right. He knew the hour had come and he was going to be going back home, going to heaven where he came from in the first place here. And he had a special love. That's what verse 1 says. I don't know if you know this or not, but when we become followers of Jesus, Jesus has a special love for us. He had a special love for his followers and he loved them until the end. So significant here. But when this word love is so much more significant than, than what you and I think. Um, um, our, we live in a culture that's very pro-love. We talk about loving everybody and, and everybody gets God's love and, 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 and anybody can receive it, which is true. For God so loved the world that he sent Jesus, his only son. Yeah, he sent him to die on the cross for us so that we would not perish but have eternal life. So love was not done based on what was good for Jesus, but what was done best for, for us. That's true love. That's true servanthood here. Yeah, and we live in a, a culture where we equate sex with love. Not necessarily true. Acceptance with love. Not necessarily true. Yeah, see, love moves us to something here. We live in a culture that has redefined love according to feelings rather than the definition Jesus gave us. This word agape, it's benevolent, it's goodwill, it's what does best for the other person, not just what feels good. It's not a rom romantic love. No, that's a different love. It's not even brotherly love. Agape is so, so much more encompassing there. But Jesus' love was expressed to you and me in the cross. It was expressed in serving, sacrifice, selfless. That defines the servant Jesus. So let's keep going. Verses 2 and 3. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew the Father had given him authority over everything, that he had come from God and he would return to God. Again, these verses are so packed with so much power here. In the midst of supper, that's right, there would have been uh, probably figs, olives, pomegranates, the biggest fruit production in, in, in Israel, uh, lamb, 
in traditional Jewish settings, there would have been chicken or roast, actually. That's what they would have at the Passover here. But lamb, um, figs, all these things here on there. And in the midst of this beautiful moment, the devil was at work. You know, we can be having beautiful moments with God and where he's encountering us in the upper room by God. But the devil was at work. The devil was at work already prompting somebody. These are the moments that sometimes we're unguarded. We're unprotected because the devil is always looking for a more opportune time. I'm just pointing this out because it's interesting that in the midst of this, with Jesus having all power and all authority. And what I see with all power and all authority is, is that Jesus was not a victim. That's right, he wasn't a victim. He wasn't this weak little victim going to the cross. No, he had all power. He could have said one word and a legion of angels would have come and released him from this moment. He could have, he could have said one thing and been released from all this. But no, God gave him all authority and all power. Why? So it could be used for other people and he could demonstrate his true heart of a servant here. Why? He could have played the, he could have played the, 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 the get out of jail free card. Get out of this torment free. But he didn't. No, he didn't. He, it wasn't about that. He knew what awaited him here. His hour had come. And this was so important. He was about to go back to heaven where he came from, which is a really, really big deal. That's where he came from. He knew what heaven was like. He knew his assignment and he embraced it. The assignment of a servant. That's what this is all about. Verse four. So he got up from the table. That's right, the low table. He got up, took off his robe, and he wrapped a towel around his waist. He poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a the towel he had around him. Now I want you to get into the moment here. They're having this, this Passover meal. And he's talking about the hour had come. He's, some significant moments are happening. And Jesus gets up. And Jesus would have been the host of the Passover here. So the host was a very very distinguished position. This robe that he took off was not just an average robe. It was a a significant, a woven robe. If you really look at it, 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 I'm guessing it was beautiful, but it was, we do know this because of the, the Greek terminology. It was very significant. And when he stood up and he took off the robe of the distinguished one in charge of the Passover, telling the story the order, the Seder order here, the, the Haggadah, the story that's being told. Yeah. And immediately, could you imagine being there and like watching Jesus walk over and taking off his robe? What are you doing? And picks up the water basin and, the, and, and wraps himself in a towel? What is he doing? I mean, it's like, like come on, who was in charge of foot washing? They didn't do their job. I mean, in the church setting, it was like, who's in charge of this? Why aren't they doing their job? Why are you making the distinguished guests do this? That's what I would be thinking here. Yeah. But what Jesus was about to do was not for a social media moment. It wasn't for a selfie. It wasn't for any of these things. It was who he was. He was just simply demonstrating the servant on the path to the cross. Jesus is the servant. And so therefore, he is selfless, sacrificing. He's serving, like, and he's given of himself, and, and he naturally does something here. Yeah, he wasn't doing this so we get him. He was doing this because this is who he was, and he was doing a significant demonstration here. So he takes the water basin. It wasn't like he took something from the table and said, hey, you guys, you, you done with the salad? I'm going to use this basin. And he dumps out the crumbs. No, there was a significant moment. They knew what that basin was for. They knew what that water was for because their feet were dirty here, and they would get them washed. So Jesus bends down with a towel on. And he takes the humble position. The, 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 the slaves who would be in charge of foot washing were the lowest of the lowest slaves. They were the lowest ones. They, didn't, they had no seniority. They had no popularity. They, they weren't high up on the food chain. They were very, very low on the chain here. Yeah, that's what they were. Yeah, 
Come on. And, 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 and so Jesus took that position. And he's cleaning Bart's toes. And Bart had lots of dirt in between his toes. And, and Thomas, he had an ingrown toenail. And, and, and then he gets to the other ones, you know, James and John. And it's like, oh my goodness, do you guys ever wash your feet? I mean, it's like, it's like this. But, but Jesus, being the humble servant, we, we don't see him as one like, okay, look what I'm doing. Oh yeah, I got four more here. Wow, all right. We don't see him like that. I, I don't see Jesus like rolling his eyes or saying, huh, hope you guys appreciate this. Hope you know what I'm doing for you. No, he doesn't do that. I, I don't believe that's the Jesus. He's taking on his servanthood here. He doesn't sigh, sigh. He doesn't groan. He doesn't moan here. He just simply takes that humble place. And he gets down low because this is what Jesus does for us. He gets down on our level. And he's not afraid of our vulnerable, nasty places of our lives. And he's not afraid of those with you either. Verse 6, when Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I am doing, but someday you will. (laughs) That's a good parent moment. I don't know, Jesus, I, I just picture the parent. Like, you don't appreciate what I'm doing for you, but someday you, you will. I'm sorry, that's the parent in me coming out. Okay, surely I digress. Going back here, verse eight. No, Peter protested. You will never wash my feet. But Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Many translations say you have no part of me. And this is so significant. Jesus is pointing to something here. He's saying, unless I wash you and clean you, you have no part of me. Wow. It's like Peter speaking up and saying, don't any of you get it? Like, I get this. I get this moment. I'm the spiritual one. I know what's going on. And it's like, come on, man. Listen. But Jesus is saying, listen, man, if you... Don't let me wash you, clean you. Um, And we receive our cleansing from Jesus, our pain, our suffering, our guilt, our shame. All of those things, the nastiest things in our life, Jesus wants to wash away. How do we do this? It's called by the blood of Jesus. And in Christianese terms, we, we use this term blood of Jesus. And when you're new to Jesus, you're new to church, you're like, what on earth is this? It's what Jesus did by shedding the blood on the cross when the nails went in and the spear in his side and his, the nails in his feet and his back was bloody. It was the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us. It's forgiveness of the cross. Yeah, that's what this is saying. In, in, in Isaiah 118, the blood of Jesus washes me white as snow. So I need washed in the blood of Jesus. It's under the blood. It's covered by the blood that doesn't only remove my sin. It removes my shame, my pain, my frustration, and everything that goes with it here. And this is how we begin a relationship with Jesus. And he's saying, till I wash you, you have no part of me. We can't clean ourselves up. We can't make ourselves clean enough or good enough or to, to, to compared to the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice of a pure and spotless Lamb here, Jesus. Yeah, Peter saw the transfiguration, the feeding of 5,000. His feet walked on water. That's Peter's feet here. But but so, so Jesus doesn't say, if you knew more, you don't have a part of me. If you weren't a better person, you don't have a part of me. No, the washing of Jesus is what gives us that equal ground here. And so the first thing we need to do to be a part of Jesus is admit we need washed. I need a washing that only Jesus Christ can provide for me on the cross because this all points to the cross. This is Christ and Passover. John 13, verse 9. Simon Peter exclaimed, Then wash my hands and my head as well. Lord, not just my feet. And Jesus replied, A person who has bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. Red letters of Jesus here. So Peter's doing what Peter does best. He blurts stuff out. I mean, if there was ever a time it's like, Peter, shh, shh, stop, stop, Peter. Ah, This is one of those times. Stop, man. Come on. But this this is it. How about this one? And many of us need this right now. Right where you are. I don't know what you're going through, but we could use this. Is this. Is Jesus is basically saying, Peter, 
Would you please stop telling me what to do? Let me do what only I can do. I don't know what you're going through in life right now, but what would it look like if we just stopped and let Jesus do what only he could do? Let Jesus be Jesus and receive what he wants to do for you. This is mercy and grace and forgiveness and cleansing. It's not being good enough or earning it. It's just simply receiving in our brokenness and our quietness and our dirty feetness and all these things. I allow him to cleanse me. This is a picture of what we do to Jesus. We start telling Jesus what he can and can't do. We tell him how to do what he should do. Let's just let Jesus be Jesus and wash us. I believe this Easter, this, these weeks leading up to Easter can be one of the most significant times of your life if we would just stop and allow Jesus to be Jesus here. That's right. Jesus taught that the initial bathing, the initial cleansing is with, with the blood of Jesus Christ. But we also need a continual cleansing. That's why in John 5, there's an illustration there that we're washed by the word of God. When we come to church, I believe that in some way we leave refreshed because the word of God washes us. It cleanses all the filth that we accumulate in our everyday lives. As we go through our everyday lives, we get dirty, we get corroded, we get all these things on us. And Jesus wants to keep washing us and cleansing us on a routine, regular basis here. That That's it. And we have no part of him until he washes us. But we need the continual washing of of not just community, but a community that is based in the word of God and that helps us get cleansed by the word of God, that helps me walk differently here. We need that continual cleansing. And that's why we want you to invite all of your friends We want you to invite them to make sure that they're here or at one of our locations, one of our four locations for Easter Sunday, one of the most significant big events of the year. Come on, we're Jesus Christ. Come on, he's the one. He's the one, it's all about him. So invest and invite them so they can receive the same thing that you have, forgiveness in Christ. Wow. Okay, let's go on to verse 11. For Jesus knew who would betray him. That's what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. Out of all the verses in this whole text, this one gets me the most. It's it's called betrayal. It's called when somebody close beside you turns you over to another. That's betrayal. And we've all been betrayed. But you know what's interesting? Not many of us picture ourselves as Judas in this. We picture ourselves as Jesus. Because after all, we've been betrayed. Somebody violated a confidence in us. This has happened to me a lot in my life. Betrayal. Confidence is broken. But the only way to handle betrayal is the way Jesus did. Serve and continue to cleanse and allow the word of God to continue to go forward. There's many of you right now, somebody hurt you, somebody betrayed you, somebody broke a confidence. There's fiery darts of the enemy. Allow the washing of the word. Allow the servant. Listen, it blows my mind that Jesus is here he says, not all of you are, are clean here. Yeah, that, that blows my mind that Jesus knew that, 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 that Judas was there and he washed his feet anyhow. I don't know about you, what I would have done. I would have made sure Judas is at the end of the line because he's not getting clean water. He's getting 11 set pairs of dirty feet washed before I get to his. That's how I think because I'm carnal. And I think with my mind, but Jesus thinks so different. He cleansed his feet anyhow here. Yeah, that's what he did. So check this out in verse 12. And after washing their feet, he put it on his robe again and he sat down. He says, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord and you are right because that's what I am. Wow. So Jesus took off the robe. And he hung up the towel. He got down low. And then when he was done, he put the robe back on and went to the head of the table as the leader of the Passover again. This is a picture of the incarnation of Jesus. He had a royal robe in heaven. He took it off, dealt with sinful mankind, dirty, in the flesh. He got humble. And then after that, 
he puts on the royal robe, resurrection, and then he goes to the head of the table in heaven to prepare a place and a banquet for us. This is a picture of something so much more significant than only what's going on here. Jesus models it. He took this robe off freely, but the next time this robe is removed from him, it's ripped from him by other people. That's right. But he, he, he joyfully did this. This is a picture of scripture for us. And he says, I'm your teacher. I'm now your instructor. And he's now the one who we learn from. But he also says, and Lord, we don't use this term Lord a lot, but Lord literally means a person exercising absolute ownership. The ultimate authority in our life is Jesus. And what he's saying is, yeah, I'm a teacher, I'm an instructor, but I'm also Lord. They understood in Roman times, in Rome, there would have been many times they would have known this because they were under Roman rule. And, and, and you would have to say publicly in, in settings, in, in big settings, and sometimes private ones, there would be statues of, C, of Caesar. And, 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 and what we would do, you had to say, you had to say Caesar's Lord. Caesar is Lord. And if you didn't say Caesar is Lord, that was considered treason. That was literally considered you were violating something and you could lose your life by not confessing the lordship to the government. The government becomes Lord. Friends become Lord. Society becomes Lord. Social media becomes Lord. Education becomes Lord. And we, we say in our minds, well, I really don't mean it, but I'm just going to say it just because like, I'm just going to walk by it. That was what was happening actually in their time. And many people say, well, I could say Caesar's Lord, but I don't really mean it. Oh, well, how do you do that? No. See, we don't understand that in the early church, people were, were, were ripped apart by savage lions and beasts. They were boiled. They were burned. They were, they, they were deprived of food, and so, so much more, imprisoned. That was the early church. They suffered. And, and we see, and we're going to see that in weeks to come. But this suffering, if the early church went through it, why do we think we're going to be any different? Why do we think so? But this is it. Is he really Lord of our lives, or is he just one way of many? Or is it just like, well... We're friends, and, and, he, and he gets me, and I love him, and he loves me, and I'm okay with him. What, when do we get to the point where he calls the shots? This is lordship here. Yeah, verse 14, and since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. Where does this start? It starts in my home. So this week, what are you going to do where you live? To your neighbors, in your apartment building. The people that you interact with, are we going to take on the heart of a servant or the one who should be served? Are we going to take on the heart of one who does what's best for others or what's best for me? This is what we see. Very few times in Scripture do we see Jesus actually teach a lesson and then say, do what I did. Now go do this for other people. Very, very few times do we actually see this. He doesn't do it a lot. But I'm going to humbly, well, how about we, this week we humbly look for other people to invest in, to give to, 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 to serve. This is what we ought to do at our workplace. Wherever it is your life is, let's take on the attitude of a servant this week and say, what's best for the other people here? That's what I want to do. How would your home be different? Your apartment building, your, your, the street you live on, your neighbors, the people you work with, the people you encounter at the grocery store, wherever it is you are. Yeah, how's your serve here? Yeah, verse 15. I have given you an example to follow. Red letters. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you, bless you for doing them. I want more of God's blessing in my life. And Jesus told me how to get it. Take on the heart of a servant. Because the path to the cross, to be like Jesus, to imitate him, is to be a servant. Blessed. Yeah. He's given us an example here. 
what blessed really means is when God extends his benefits. It means you're envied by others. You're enviable. That's right. This is what it is. When we do the things of Jesus, other people envy us. They want what we have. Some translations say happy. Yeah, happy are you who do this. When we take on the heart of the servant, just like Jesus, we become blessed, envied. We receive all his benefits. So the difference between not receiving his benefits and receiving them are doing what Jesus asked us to do. That's it. So number one today, I want to ask you this. Has Jesus washed you? Has he, has he washed your life? That's, has he forgiven you? The blood of Jesus Christ, has that cleansed you? And is it continuing to cleanse you? Are you a part of a community of believers that has the word of God cleansing you and washing you and refreshing you and removing the dirt and filth from your life? That's right, looking into the vulnerable and the nasty parts and the dirtiest parts of our lives. Do you have that? Jesus Christ is that. Ask him to be the forgiver of your past by the blood of Jesus Christ. Ask him to wash you clean and then ask him to be your Lord the one in charge, and watch what he will do in releasing all of his benefits to you. I didn't say give you an easy life. I didn't say everything will be perfect, but I do know this. He's going to show up in a great way, a great way for you and me. This Easter is going to be one of the most significant ones if we will just simply look to Jesus as the servant, look to his suffering, and look to his sovereignty, and watch what he will do. I'm so thankful for this time together. Make sure that you come back next week for the next part about the suffering. But don't turn off because Pastor Eric's going to lead us into a time of communion right now. Thanks so much for being with us.